Well, thank you everybody for coming this morning, rainy morning. Um, I wanted to, to maybe do a little overview of what I'm gonna do. And um, the idea here is, is kind of an introduction to gelatin printing and maybe some tips on how to do it best or how to entertain yourself or do it more interestingly if you want. Um, and don't, don't think of this method only as printing per se, like finished products and prints because we mostly cannot compete with having a, a printing program that uses a big press and different, different inks and oil-based inks in, in particular. But, um, but this is an incredible approximation to not having a press. I, more and more, the more I, okay, the more I um, research it and do things with it, the more I realize that the sky is the limit. Um, but it doesn't require much to get started. So a gel plate can be, if you can all see my uh, tabletop, a gel plate can be a gel press or a product. This happens to be jelly print because I had it at home. Jelly press, sorry. And, and just it's so everyone knows uh, be, uh, that there are two Marianas and you may have to pin the one yes, that is the right. activity. Because in order for you to see me talking and my tabletop, I need to do, there's two of us. Hi, everyone. Hi, Gail. Hi. Hi, welcome. So the two, two plates, you. one is uh, the commercial one that most people are possibly acquainted with. The other one is a homemade one. And I have lots more in our studio. Well, not lots more, a few more in this studio, but I'm very happy to share the, um, the um, recipe because it's not proprietary. And this is a small gelatin plate that I've already coated with some paint because I wanted to show you a particular approach to it, but this is what it is. And the nice thing about the homemade ones is they're cheap to make, relatively speaking. And you can also, if they go bad or, or if you nick it without realizing, you can remelt it. And you can also make some other, some other shapes and, and things that you cannot make with a commercial plate. But so I'm gonna be using both today. Um, the, the essential things that we, that we need are very few. Um, the plate, some, some um, these happen to be golden high flow acrylics, but just because I have them here, I also have some heavy body regular acrylics and you can very easily use um, uh, craft acrylics also. Um, so, but if you want to be more archival and more, um, more artistic with them, I recommend highly that you invest in some good quality, uh, paper, uh, sorry, acrylic, um, uh, product. And it, it can be the one is that's probably best is the, um, golden or plaza, uh, not, they're not high flow, they're uh, fluid acrylics. So they're liquid, but they have a creaminess to them. Right now I'm gonna use the high flow because they're mostly transparent, but when I need coverage, I'm gonna use something else. So you'll see me grabbing different things. So um, the other thing you need is a brayer or, it, or a roller. I have been known to make my own. So if anybody wants to make their own, I can tell them how to do it but these are relatively cheap and, uh, and having a large one and a small one is nice, um, but not necessary. You can just, for years and years, I just did a four inch one and never had a little one. And um, so the acrylics in the paper, the papers can be anywhere from like cardstock. You don't want copy paper, although that works well. Um, if you want to preserve your work on a copy paper, it's a little flimsy, but you certainly can try. This is just regular cardstock. It's not archival. And the thing I prefer the best is this stuff that uh, Plaza actually sells. It's made by the Paycon, Paycon or Paycon company. And it's um, heavy duty um, 
in uh, construction paper like your kids use, but the white and black are acid free. So, so it looks like a nine by 12 or a double, they have a double size to in black and white. It, and it's like 50 sheets for $7 or something like that. It's a real deal. And um, so Plaza has it if you want to use it. And then this, then you need just found objects. So I'm gonna start with some uh, printing of, I'm gonna put this plate aside because the demo with this is coming up in a minute, in a few minutes. And the other things I'm going to do is I'm gonna use this plate, which is an eight by 10. And I'm gonna un uncover it. and put this somewhere safe. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna use it, now let me see. I'm gonna use it on top of a white piece of paper because I spill over on the sides and it's helpful to recover the, um, to, that, to have the other, the paper absorb the fluid acrylics that spill over. So I can start with any color, it's good to, um, you know, to look at a, a car, a, a um, color wheel and sort of plan your colors, but you don't have to be planned full at the beginning. I am just choosing some light colors to start because I intend to later use some darker colors that I want to um, create some layers from. So I am using a little bit of red. And, uh, and normally if I want this, because I'm giving you a demonstration and talking, I wanna retard the drying time because acrylics can dry very fast. And depending on where you are, you, you can get them to dry even uh, if your um, environment is really uh, warm and dry, you're gonna have them retard quickly. So I'm adding a, open golden open medium I buy the big bottle right now but you can also make your own retarder with some glycerin and water if anybody wants to know I'm happy to give them it's about a third glycerin and two thirds and a third part um, glycerin and the other two thirds is water all right so I'm going to smooth the the coloration onto the plate. And I'm gonna make what I call a background print. Now this, this is very light. Um, these, these paints are very transparent. So I haven't, um, I may want to add a soft body acrylic, but not, not necessarily. Um, and I'm gonna take the first print and I'm using the construction paper. Before I do that, I can make some patterns on this. Just I'm using some homemade foam, um, foam uh, uh, stamps and, and tools at the end of a row of, of um, scotch tape. And then I've carved a few out of large erasers. I've carved a few animal prints just to have a little bit of background. But this may come out very light and, and that's okay. If it's too light for me to actually see, I may do it again. So I put the paper down and I'm uh, smoothing it with my hands. In fact, um, that's all you need. Some people use a Baron, which is a printing device that smooths over a print, but you don't have to. And actually it picked up quite a lot. Can you see a little bit of the texture? We're gonna lose much of this texture in the next printing, but you'll see, I'm trying to create a layer. I am going to use a, a, a more contrasting color now, like a green. Oops, okay. And I'm gonna put a little bit of the retard or the open medium. 
but I'm gonna also put some burnt sienna. This is a little bit, I just don't want it to be only green and maybe a little bit of gray. Okay, so this layer will go over that one. But in between, we're going to use some vegetation, which uh, makes a really nice printing. To make a really nice effect. So I went uh, looking, I, I went weeding yesterday in my yard and I found quite nice things to, to pick up, which are mostly weeds. I didn't have to trash my plantings. The weeds make fantastic patterns. So I have a, a kind of one-sided um, design here. And if I want to make it a little more interesting, I'm going to grab a piece of cord and do a little bit of a counterbalance with some like organically placed um, thread. Can you see it at all? So what I'm going to do is print over this. And what I love about doing this process of printing with my hands is that I can feel where the stems are and I press down around the stems to make sure that, that I get a good printing rather than a blob of white or a blob of unprotected color. And I can even lift it up a little bit and see if I'm getting some printing. And if I don't, I can let it go while I'm holding the registration, meaning the place of the paper onto the plate so that I didn't have to reposition it. And here I saw that I need a little more pressing down. If you do this with a baron or some other object, you don't feel, you don't feel it. So it gives you an advantage to actually. So you get a, um, a leafy, now I probably could have, let me see, I probably could have gotten a little more. I didn't notice here, but let me see if I can read recover a little, I normally don't do it to, to get a little more printing over there because I saw that I hadn't pressed enough. But this is one way in which you can get uh, a, a vegetation print. But then the, the other nice thing is that if you take another piece of paper, when you remove these things, you get a beautiful pattern of the leaf shape, the, the leaf texture becomes printed. And it can be a wonderful print on its own. I don't know if you can see that. And I'm gonna come close for you to see the, the pattern of the, the leaves created. It's so interesting um, to me. And it, it, again, if I had chosen very smooth planted leaves, it might not have had so much uh, texture to go through. So I'm going to make a quick other one before moving on to other subjects. I'm going to do a yellow, yellow oxide, they call it. It's a little bit like a raw umber color and a little bit of red. But again, the red is transparent. So we'll see. And, and how about if I add a little bit of white? I don't want it to look white. And the reason is that white is my paper, right? So I just want to mix some of these colors and I didn't add the retarder. A little bit of the open medium, just a few drops. And I'm brayering getting a sort of pinkish yellow. And I will do a little more, by the way, I cleaned the brayer on another sheet. And sometimes these prints can be fantastic when you lift them up. 
you're, you're about to toss them and you notice some beautiful effect. So I'm going to try to, to do some found object printing. You know what this is. You all have bought potatoes or onions at the supermarket. And uh, of course, you know what this is, polluting our world. And again, I don't want to have too many white areas. Um, let me see, it's just, I'm doing a gentle printing. I don't want to withdraw a lot of um, color because I want to make sure that the paper doesn't stay white. And this is my first of a couple of layers. So I'm picking up what I did. And that's going to be my background print. And you can see that the colors are very kind of gentle and um, sort of tints, really. Uh, and I am going to use a different, a different color for the contrasting top, the blue in this case. But I'm going to put a little bit. Whoops. Of a quinacridone nickel azo, which used to be called gold. Quinacridone gold. And golden keeps changing the name, but it's a gorgeous color. And I think I may or may I may not have enough contrast. I may want no. I think it's going to be okay. I just looked at the background, like at the background print rather. Again, I'm trying to keep my brayer clean. And this time I'm going to do a couple of different. When I see that a piece of vegetation is very dense, like on average, this is gonna give me a lot of just white because there's so much overlap of leaves. So I, th I thin it out because I really want to try to capture the silhouette of the plant or of the vegetation that I'm using. So I'm going to have it be a little bit less dense and try to create that. And uh, on the other side, I'm going to use, uh, let's see, what here? <laughs> some other grasses that I found. Oops. Again, I'm thinning them out a tiny bit because I don't want globs to appear. Let's see how that will do. The spring is a, and the summer are great times to do this. In the winter, we are a little bit more deprived of this kind of material. So I'll show you what I do when I don't have vegetation or when I don't want to do vegetation printing. I, again, I'm gonna lift it up and, and peek to see, see, I got a lot of globby shapes. So I'm gonna go back and try to selectively print. If I, around the, the, the um, denser parts of the vegetation. Hello. So let me see, I'm gonna peek again. And you see, I got some more um, kind of lines, which makes it a little more interesting to me than the blobs. This one is blobby still. So I'm gonna go back. Remember I'm keeping my hand on the plate. So the registration is uh, kept and I don't need to reposition things. Now I'm gonna, raise this side and I see a blob here. So I'm going to go back and try to insist on picking up a paint from the bottom. And my paper is about to rip, so I have to be careful not to rip it. But you see when the fluid of the paint goes through the paper, I know that I'm pushing it. So I have to balance those two things. Let me see if I got less glob here where I want it. Yeah, a little bit, I got a silhouette. 
So uh, silhouette of, uh, of plants are very interesting to me. And sometimes they can be so interesting that they identify the plant simply by the silhouette. I'm not that good at gardening, but I'm sure some of you are. So as you can see, um, I have a couple of, uh, this could make a, a frameable print. Don't have a lot of space to, but you could you could see this as a frameable print or a um, certainly you can put it in a card or you can use it to cut papers that are colored in different ways. And I have um, I think I I sent one of my pieces that is done using collage um, cutting papers that I printed this way, but I didn't necessarily use as finished prints. So that for, to do a collage, I recommend the thinner papers and I'll talk to you about them in a moment. Right now I've been using the heavy duty um, construction paper. And again, I'm now taking off the vegetation and sometimes what this is called the ghost print for those of you who may not know that term, it just means that it's what's left over on the plate after you pick up the first print. And I'm going to pick it up on its own. And sometimes it just makes the best print. So you never know. You have to be, and for this, um, this kind of uh, the approach of gel printing lends itself to uh, introduce you to art making because you don't have to have a lot of preconceived notions or know how to draw or know, or know how to combine certain colors. Um, and, but you might get interested in those things to learn later. But let's see. So I talked too long and I didn't get, even though I had the, the retarder, it didn't come out very well. So there's one thing I can do, which is to, um, so I can recover this. And let me see um, where my paper, my thinner paper is. I will try to recover it with some delicate texan paper. Or in this case, um, I could use delicatessen paper or Japanese kozo paper, which is a little bit thicker. So what I can do, because it's dry on the plate, is I'm going to put some matte medium on it. You can use gloss medium or whatever you like to pick up a ghost print. Sorry, this is not pouring out. You can dry it out at the tip. Come on. Okay, it's coming out now. So a little bit, I don't need much. And I'm going to smoothly cover the plate again. And what I'm trying to do, if it works, is to pick up, the, have the two layers, the layer that dried on the plate and the layer that I put on top, fuse together so I can pick them up. And what I do is lay the paper on top and I'm using this Japanese paper, which is very thin and it's beautiful when you want to use it for collage because it kind of disappears. You can also use tissue paper, but tissue paper is a little bit less resistant to, to letting it sit. I'm going to let this sit for a moment or two longer than I do the other prints because I want the two layers, the matte uh, medium, which is an acrylic, and the previous dry layer, which is also acrylic, to fuse together, okay, and then be allowed to be lifted onto my paper. And I, and sometimes it takes a little bit longer than you hope, but let's see, I'm in a pretty dry environment. So uh, as you can see, it is lifting it. But it's also very easy to tear it. So I have to carefully maneuver the paper out. But you see it cleaned up my plate. There's no pattern on the plate. And here is the ghost print. 
So this alone, again, could uh, be put onto a, a piece of white and glued on with some other things or be framed. I think this is really lovely um, on its own. So you could actually um, use this to frame if you want, or you can, um, one thing that many people do is uh, glue it onto cards and say happy birthday or something like that. It's something unique that Hallmark doesn't provide <laughs> every day, but you have it yourself. So you send somebody something you made. Anyway, so these are the sort of vegetation prints that I wanted to walk you through. Please ask any questions either in the chat and maybe if, uh, if Jordan can take a look at it while I'm talking or, or feel free to interrupt me and you know how to unmute yourself temporarily with your space bar. You have one. Marianne, right, I have a quick if, question. Yeah, um, go ahead. The, the technique is mostly done with, with uh, paper and I was thinking, is, are there other ways you can use this technique to add thing or add uh, imagery to canvas or a panel or, or another surface other than paper. I'm thinking maybe if you flip the plate upside down, you're printing almost upside excellent. down. Yes, excellent question. So, um, so yes, it depends on your plate and how much you can maneuver it. Like if it's a big plate, it's harder to do, but you can print directly on canvas. It takes a little um, practice because some plates are, especially the home, the homemade plate is probably the softest of them all. And you are more likely to get a good printing on the canvas. But these plates, uh, I didn't talk about how the plates are made. The plate that I call homemade is literally made with unflavored gelatin. These plates are, even though they're called gelatin plates, they have no gelatin in them. They're called, uh, they're made with a Versa gel that is um, proprietary to DuPont. And that's why they cost so much. Um, and it's, uh, it's not at all gelatin, but, but they, they do an excellent job printing as well, but they are, and they're a little more resilient. So uh, I could take this plate, for example, and print onto a canvas or a, um, or a board or an illustration board uh, and be part of my developing design. So I could contribute to my own design. The, the, the easiest way to do it is to do, oops, the small plates, which I, now is a good time to show you. Uh, remember I said this homemade plate, I had put a couple of layers of things and I wanted to show you another way of picking up, it's completely dry. And, and I could take this and, uh, literally put it on my canvas because it's functioning as a stamp. And that's the nice thing about being able to make your own because you can make any size. Um, although they sell these now and they have them in brown and they have them in elongated and all, and all that. But being able to make this is really nice because you can really print on canvas and you can do um, all kinds of things you can imagine. In addition, you can print on thin paper and then glue that onto canvas or board. And I have done that in my, um, in, in the design that I sent you, the, the larger floral piece is full of little torn pieces of collage that are done this way. But let me show you how you can pick this up. And remember I said in the, the previous print that dried, I, I picked it up with some matte medium. I'm going to switch right now and use white and put a few drops of white. I don't want to flood it. I want very little because the key here is to get the two layers to bond together. And if I have too much white, it's not gonna bond. It's gonna not take longer to dry and I may not get my desired results. So I'm putting, white directly on this little plate, which I had done a couple of layers onto a different colors. And quickly, I'm going to, uh, I may have let it dry again. If I do, I'll do it again. But um, I'll take a piece and put it on and hold. Uh, heat is another thing that, um, 
acrylic paint is sensitive to. Uh, we probably all have experienced plastic things um, melting or becoming distorted when left in the sun. And that is just a inherent property of acrylics. They never, they're always in motion. So acrylic paints, just like uh, plastic toys and latex paint can melt with heat. So what I'm trying, what I'm gonna try to do now is see, see not try to do, I'm gonna do it, but see, it didn't pick up completely, but it has picked up it, it, quite an amount. I could wait a little bit longer. Um, and and uh, the heat that I'm generating with my hands may actually help me to pick up. Alternatively, I can put, I can lift and put a drop of the um, matte medium that I had before that I mentioned to you. And I'm going to keep in, keeping my registration, meaning I'm not moving it because I want to just recover what I missed. I'm going to see if I can pick up those two layers. The reason for doing the two layers was to show you how layering in this method can yield very interesting results. And so sometimes you don't, you don't know what you'll pick up. And, and if you love experimentation, this method is for you. If you're impatient and want to have more control of what you're doing, this method may drive you nuts. So it's a balance between what people want. <laughs> it's a wonderful way to work with children um, and temper paints. I would recommend not doing acrylics uh, with children or youngsters, but temper paints. So I'm pressing a little more. I don't, I don't want to keep you just, but let me see. Hey. So what I wanted to show you is kind of the effect of the layering. And I did it on a small plate because I knew I could get it to dry on a bigger plate. It's a little, but you see how slick it looks. Now the white provided the white background, it would also have done it because I have a white paper, but sometimes it's wonderful to do on a transparent paper, like delicatessen paper, and to and you get a semi-transparent or translucent print. This one is done on opaque, and you see how I picked up that whole section that hadn't, it didn't line up completely because my brayering might have disturbed the alignment but it's a really nice way of recovering something that you lost to dryness. So um, more, more things. So when I don't do vegetation and uh, Felisa it, it, who just asked me a question is a wonderful colleague and she and I have taught many classes together um, on this technique. Uh, um, I have something else that uh, I like to try and I'm gonna show you. So I am using a, what they call it transparent yellow oxide, just to let you know what I'm putting on the plate, although it's not, the colors are not as important as seeing how it's used and what results and some quinacridone yellow gold and the retarder. Let me put a little more. You know what, I'm probably, I'm gonna clean my brayer on this one just to keep it going to dry. And, um, and then I'm going to do some pa patterning on, on this. A little piece. And again, I, I try to use all the, all the material that I generate onto another, all the, all the paint I use somewhere else to clean it because you never know what you get. Now, this is a piece of, um, uh, is a piece like this of styrofoam where I carved, if you can see it some, uh, with the back of a brush or the back of a pencil, you can carve all kinds of things. If you want, this one happens to have leaves. 
So, so here I am doing, trying to get the pattern to, to print and you can see that it did. And I'm going to also clean it onto another piece of paper. And I still have more, so I'm gonna press down. All right, and um, a couple more. of these and then I will print because I want to show you something else. I'm going to next use a stencil to that is hand carved. And um, you know, there are many commercial stencils available out there, but it's so fun when you originate your own material to design your own work if you're a little more committed to doing art with this. Um, so this is the first layer. And what I'm going to do is get a pretty dark, almost black, but I'm gonna add some blues as well so that there's a little variety within the dark to, uh, I have a purple here, nice purple diary line dioxazine purple, and then a regular black, which she's hiding from me right now. No, I had, okay, where are you black? I'm gonna have to use the shading gray, but it's right here. Okay, and retarder. My white and my retarder look too similar, so I have to be careful. Okay, let me see if this gets dark enough. Just to offer some contrast. I can, by the way, mix colors when I go around on the plate with the brayer. And so um, even if I see something stuck there, for example, I can, insist a little bit. I don't want to um, change the, the print too much, but I'm getting a pretty good dark. You can see, can you see it where I sampled it? No, let me make sure. Oops. Can you see it, the, the dark that I sampled here? So what I did earlier is I just cut a piece of it. I took a transparency and I cut the shape of a woman who is throwing a ball. And what that is going to do is going to be a mask. You'll see it in a minute, because I know you cannot see it because the transparency is lying directly on the, on the acrylic. I am going to over print it onto this. And again, just like the vegetation, I'm feeling for the edges when I press down on the plate. Okay, let's see. And that should not take long to pick up. So you have, again, you a silhouette. I'm just making, I'm trying to make sure, can you see it? Yeah, thank you. So it can be fun then to, you could stamp some leaves or whatever you want um, around this, um, this image, but it's really cool to have like your child's picture or doing something or something like that in a stencil that you can use. And the nice thing is you can reuse it in the opposite direction also. So you can also overlap many different uh, masks. So a stencil is something that has holes in it, right? And normally that's what we call a stencil. A mask is something that prevents printing. And a stencil normally has air holes and areas that also prevent printing. So a stencil, like the commercial stencil is a mask and a stencil. But I'm going to pick her up, pick up the image. Ariana, how do you decide 
Um, how do you decide yeah. what is going to make a good print versus, you know, something that you'll maybe cut up later? Like right. how do you decide what's successful versus not? That's a great question. So I, so that's why I kind of have, um, I brought these um, L shapes just to guide me about, well, if, it, if this is somebody I know or something that I want to, I, I evaluate the negative shapes and the positive shapes and the, the composition, just like I would when I'm designing something. And, and I say, well, is this imbalance that, can you see her? Um, is this kind of, it, it has some imbalance. It's, she's leaning in one direction, but I really like that she cuts through the other side of the uh, paper and, and it creates two negative shapes that I really like. And so I might go for this as a print that I put in a mat. Um, alternatively, say if I had done another image and I got this by the way from some advertising, you know, I look for interesting negative shapes in advertising. And again, technically it's not my image but it's a silhouette of something I saw. So I'm not completely violating copyright, but we're in a gray area here, right? Like all collage and all and all uh, other, but so I could, I actually change some things because I like to when I was um, cutting her. And, and um, so that's how I would evaluate it. Just like any composition, if it's worth, um, worth it to me, if it was my child, no matter what the composition, I might frame it. But, but um, not really if it's something, it's something foreign and I'm aiming for an artistic product, I would use the same compositional rules that we do, um, including, you know, all the, the elements and principles of design, including color, and I would evaluate the color, I would think about, you can outline something like this, you can always be doing things to it. Um, and then it would be a, a monoprint based composition, but it would have other elements. For example, I could use pan pastels or simply markers and do some other texturing here. So it, it doesn't mean that it has to stay like this, but then it's a print with other elements like a mixed media print. Does that kind of get at your question? Sometimes if it's just something like this, for example, um, I might use, uh, I don't know if you can see, but the, the, print, the, the print of the stamp and the gray kind of uh, collaborated here. And there is a little bit of a graininess of orange, which is lovely. So I might cut this piece, for example, to express something in a collage and not, you know, this is obviously not something that I would frame, but pieces of it can be helpful to me. And so I'm constantly generating printed papers. And we all, anybody who has tried this has bags and bags of printed, not perfect prints. Um, and the question is how to use them. One way is to embellish them further. Another way is to cut them up and make cards. <laughs> Another way is to cut them up and make collage pieces or and keep them. And I usually organize them. And my students know this. I usually keep them in big bags with Ziploc, you know, Ziploc bags. And I keep them by warm, cool, black and white. And that really helps me because if I'm looking for a yellow, hi Mia, welcome. If, if I'm looking for a yellow, I can, uh, <laughs> I can um, go to the warms. If I'm looking for a red, same thing. If I'm looking for a mixed thing, sometimes I find it in the warm, sometimes in the cool. But this was my choice after um, contemplating the alternative, which would be have a bag for every color. And then I would go crazy. So the warms and cools helps me more. And I, I have done um, several works. Um, if you indulge me for a moment, I could share my screen and show you a little bit of some of the works that I've done using papers. This is like some, you know, matted uh, prints that I have from 
leaves from a photograph I took. So I made a stencil that had the leaf patterns and then I covered it with uh, a white pickup, um, saving the, the, as a mask, what I cut out. This one is uh, a few years ago, there was a folk festival at, at um, Golenico and I carved, I designed the little thing that we printed on music paper. You see it in the background. So it was, uh, so that's what we did. I, this is a uh, funky uh, print of house and building shapes. I'm fascinated by building shapes. And so I sometimes will print and I'll show you in a minute um, how to do something like this. And this is one that I called in the nighttime because it was probably a pickup from a ghost print that ended up um, having many colors. This is from um, a, a stencil or a mask rather from an advertising. I really liked the position of this man and I, um, and I uh, did many colors and then obscured, uh, I picked up with the, with his uh, mask applied, um, the, I picked up everything else gray so that you could still see, see the shape or the silhouette of the person um, through, through the, with the colors that I initially applied. Um, now this is a more complex thing. This has a lot of tissue papers that have been printed this way. And unfortunately the slide thing does not allow me to get close. This is hanging in our studio and I can't, uh, I don't think, oh yeah, I can make it a little bit larger. Can you see, although the, I think the, I'm limited by, it's a low resolution copy on there. But I, I'll show you the next one. This one is also, I, um, this was a model that I was uh, painting from, it's an acrylic. And then she had a very complex fan. And I had carved a, a stamp that had some beautiful ornamentation from like uh, the Rococo era or something. And I decided to print it onto the fan. Um, and I believe I did it directly on the canvas. So this was a big, big um, uh, carved stamp that's about, uh, I don't know, maybe 12 inches by 12 inches. And I printed it onto the fan. This one is um, one that actually we have on display at BWI Airport right now. There's a group show of, of, of multiple multiple shows at BWI, but it also normally hangs in our studio. And you can see, oops, I'm sorry. Let me see if I can make it a little bit larger. You see the leaves um, here. I don't know if you can see my arrow. Does the arrow show? The leaves have some patterns that you couldn't really make with paint. They're kind of random. You see this one, you know, so I kind of use them for the foreground leaves. And, uh, and sometimes I do a trial and error and I will put this down and if I don't like it, I can cover it. So that's the beauty of collage, but the collage is made with all the, all the images that I had created by gelatin printing. The same thing with this one. Let me see if I can show you a little bit. You can see that the purples have a lot of um, designs or texture in them and they're completely random, but pleasing to me uh, along the lines of what Jordan asked before, which is how do I decide whether I want to use some piece for art or not, either to frame on their own or to continue working on with to a collage. So I just wanted to show you um, all the different things and mostly I, I had a period of very floral um, design. That's what I wanted to show you how you can use the papers. For the collage, I tend to favor very thin papers so that I can make them sort of disappear and they don't have many edges or, or, or raised edges on my collage. If I did end up with raised edges and I didn't want, I would use some an acrylic medium like modeling paste or molding paste, depending on how you want to call it, to kind of gradate the edges so that it's, it's all part of a smoother appearance. 
on the surface of the art. Yeah. So I'm going, by the way, I never, I rarely clean my um, stencils or, or masks. And now this one in particular, it was disappearing before. Now it has some color. So I will be able to find it again in my stash, as you can see. Mariana, so I have, I have yeah. a question. Uh, when you're talking about stencils and masks, so if you wanted to do a, a photograph of your your kid, you would get the clear acrylic and then trace it, right? Yes, yeah, that's the easiest way. Okay, but if you wanted to say you drew something like you said with holes in it, you could do that on just regular paper and then cut it out with the exact- Oh, good question, good question. How to make your own stencils and masks. You can use acetate sheets or mylar sheets. Okay. And the, the more transparent, the better because you can then trace like uh, Kristen said. But you can also do them on, um, on uh, freezer paper. They're wonderful on freezer paper. They may not last as long as the acetate. Uh, and that one wouldn't allow you to see through it. Okay. You would have to copy or your design or redraw it. Um, and I would draw it on the back of the freezer paper. Now, in, in other words, not in the glossy surface, but that's what's going to help you preserve your piece. Um, another fabulous thing for stencils and masks is, but it's a little more expensive, is Tyvek. If you have a builder friend who has a lot of leftover Tyvek, or you can buy those envelopes, you know, at the office shop. Um, and I did that. I, it used to be that you could pick them up at the U.S. Post Office, but I think they probably poor things limited that now. Um, but anyway, it, it doesn't matter that it has a design on it. And um, if you want to buy white Tyvek, you can go to Home Depot and they have it, but it's quite expensive. Uh, so I use, uh, if we get an envelope, you know, a mailing here, I don't get, I don't get rid of the Tyvek. You can do so many things with Tyvek out, aside from gelatin printing and uh, stencils and stamps. So but I highly recommend it. You can also use um, parchment paper. It's wonderful for stencils. And you know, you can put it in the oven so, and it doesn't degenerate, not, not much over 400 degrees. So it, it lasts a little bit, but you can, but they can tear, it can tear more easily, that's all. But so what I'll do now to save my stencil, if I want to save this, I'll keep the, this and, and her cut out in a clear, um, what do you call, call them, Fo uh, fold, um, the clear sheets with three holes. <laughs> uh, they're not sheets, they're um, envelopes. Um, so I keep them that way. That way I know this is a st stencil or a, st or a mask I want to keep, for example. And this is the image it creates. So I keep them together so I know, oh no, I may not want all this white space all around. So that's not one that I want to use. What is an oh, Tyvek, um, Penny, Tyvek, T-Y-V-E-K. You know how you walk by constructions and the house might say Tyvek all over the place or there's other, uh, other corporations, Tyvek is DuPont. Um, there is another one that is like house something and it has all that stamped all over, but they use it for insulation. Like when they're zipping up the, just before they put the brick or the siding or whatever. So that's what, what the material is. And the first thing to do is to look at envelopes that you get in the mail. <laughs> and if you want some, I'm happy in class to, to give you some. Um, anyway, so I wanted, to, I wanted to show you a little bit about my obsession if you guys are game with um, with houses, I wanted to make one with with houses. So, what I'm going to do is because I want the background first to set the houses in the background. I will uh, put a little bit of blue. Like I'll, I'll think about you know, do I want daytime, nighttime? Oops, excuse me. I'll put this away. Um, and then, you know, do I want like grass or not grass, but just very, very loosely. I don't want to, 
pre-prescribe what I'm gonna do. Oh, wait a minute. I have to think backwards. And that's the hard part in this technique that sometimes you go, you, you thought about the colors you wanna introduce and then you go, oh my God, I blocked all the colors with the second printing. So you have to kind of think backwards a little bit. These colors are gonna be the houses. So, okay. So the colors that I put in here are going to be part of the body of the housing. And sorry, bear with me because, um, and then I, it'll become clear to you, hopefully. Oh, I put this already. Okay. So I'm doing a light, light thing because I'm using these mostly transparent, but let me show you my, my wealth of, of housing shapes. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna do them horizontal. Think, let, let me know if you cannot see if I do it this way, hold on. You can see, yeah, I think you can see, right? So what I'm gonna do is put this bridge kind of shape on the opposite side. Uh, these are little house things that I completely invented. And I tend to keep them again um, in my files. Uh, maybe, maybe like that. And it's fun to, I did a series on uh, houses, Greek houses, and I think I ended up with some churches, because Greeks love churches. Uh, let's see, I don't wanna put too much. So this is kind of a random application of house shapes. Mariana, excuse me, yeah. but you left, you left the brush under the right side of your plate. Yes. The paint yeah. brush under the right side of your plate, your paintbrush. Yeah. Under the Thank right side. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And the string. <laughs> All right, let's see if it'll come up. So I had wanted to do a background, but I'm not doing a back. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, I'm gonna get white houses right now. See, I made a mistake, meaning that I'm thinking of them as like this. And this is not that helpful to me right okay. now, although it taught me the lesson that I thought backwards. Mariana, can I interrupt just for a second? Yeah. Because I've seen this, like, do you ever then, when you take it off right now, yeah. you use your original print and try to get the ghost print on those white surfaces? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, you know what? It misaligns many times, but let's right. try it right now. That's right. a good okay. suggestion. Okay, because I've seen people, they have- Very a, good suggestion. A, it's so light. I'm not sure I'll get right. something, okay. but let's try it. And in this case, I should have uh, planned the registration, which means the alignment, but I didn't. And, and Jelly Press and, and other companies are trying to, show, to sell you little rulers where you can adjust, adjust the, your quote registration, which just means alignment with your previous print so that you are exactly where you were before. Right now I did it completely randomly, but you get something like this. And the reason that it didn't sort of, uh, you know, it, that it wasn't so, so inspirational is that it's the same color and we didn't exploit the contrast. But that's a very good suggestion. Sometimes you want to do that over printing. So in that case, you have to remember to kind of like remember what the, your alignment. Um, but let me do a, again a background piece, which I'll I will do with many colors. And then yes, I will do with many colors. That's what I had intended to do, and somehow. I distracted myself from doing it. Oh, uh, the, a little bit of this color and a little bit of, it's good when you're starting out, by the way, to limit your color choices to a little bit of an analogous part of gamut on the color wheel. 
and that way you are more secure, more um, granted more of an opportunity to have harmony. Although I'm using very transparent pigments today, and in the studio we have both transparent and not and uh, opaque, but the transparent uh, are very forgiving in the sense that you don't cover everything. Even if you make a mistake, it's not likely you'll, you'll um... oh, and let me do some textures also. So uh, another piece of styrofoam with just some lines. And I'll put, and um, have you guys, anyone bought these little sponges to clean your hands and, and they are, they have these little fins or these little tips, which print out also like that. I don't know if you can see it. It's the texture. Can you see it at all? It has dots. It's just dots. Um, and uh, in some other, I did a, a wooden, I would like pattern. And uh, let's see. And from a medication pill, from a medication bottle, the cover had a nice design. So there, now I'm going to do the background print. So no, no shapes on this one, except the texture that we did with the found object. And we got some color colors and we got some lines that are going to, now I'm going to do, uh, let's see, the contrasting, the very contrasting. So I'm gonna use blues and purples. And I still can't find my black. Oh, wait a minute, no. Is it behind there? Must have fallen down. Ah, okay. And a little bit of the retarder, which is right here. I'm not sure if the retarder is actually doing anything, but hey. Ah. I have a hair that fell down and it's creating some havoc, but that's all right. Oh, it's making extra textures. I think it's on the brayer. <laughs> the hair is on the brayer. Anyway, now I get to create my little city. I'm looking for ones that have the windows already in. And we had done the bridge, where is it? The bridge and vegetation. Yeah. And maybe one, maybe. I have also a series on, um, on uh, DC landmarks and I carved, uh, I uh, burned stencils to create um, like uh, DC monuments. I can show you some other time. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go over what I printed before. So over printing. And let's see whether this will work or not. What do you think, Mia? Will it work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Abracadabra. Ah. <laughs> so it's a little bit too centered for my taste, but you know, you get a kind of a sense of a place or a city or a neighborhood. 
So you can do more and you can do, for example, I could do a third one. And let me actually do that with my, with some heavy body acrylics. And I'm gonna go opaque now. And again, I don't rinse them, but I'm gonna do some more houses. So I'm gonna do a few. Let's see what happens if I do a, a darker color. And I'm going to use this, let's see. Oh, I should have, um, well, I'll show you how I can rescue myself out of this one. Uh, I can put a little color here. This happens to be a viridian that's not very good quality. And uh, what I want to do is cover, because I already lined up the, um, the houses and I meant to do it as background, I will Put the color over the uh, oops, over the houses, and then remove the houses before I print. But I want some more dark, so I'm going to take another another darker blue and do the same thing. Hold on one sec. Here and there. So normally I don't do this, which is to put the color over the stencils or masks, but because I goofed and I put it down, put them down too early, I don't have to start again. I can just continue to, to work and then remove the houses. And I'll show you. This paint has seen better days. Although sometimes you get some interesting effects that you didn't expect. Now, if I print directly on this, it's going to all get all muddled, right? So now I need to remove these. And I could put them in a vat of water, by the way, just to rinse them, or I can let them, sometimes when I do papers like parchment, um, stencils, they get, they get stronger when, when you let the paint dry on them. Does that make sense to people? So what I'm going to do is literally over print over this. Oh, this thing comes along. Let me remove it. So it's a little more um, mysterious, if you will. You can also um, do like little windows, just like I have some stencils that only have little windows. And so you can over, over print some window shapes. Anyway. That's that. And how do I clean the plate? I usually, if I want to switch colors, for example, I clean the plate with a little water and alcohol. This is on a um, hair product. Um, um, in, in a bottle that is really nice spray from a hair product. So when I finished the product, I kept the bottle. And, and the plate becomes quite clean. The alternative, of course, is to let all of it dry, dirty, and then pick it up next time you use it with your first printing or putting some... Um... Oh, I kept you longer. I'm sorry. I just looked at the time. Thank you. I mean, I, I need to, so any questions, please email me or call me. I'm happy to show people uh, supplies or to give them some advice on what to buy if you're interested in doing something with this method or just simply for your curiosity. So let me know if you have any questions.
<laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you it's wonderful. Thank you for bearing thank you. with me. I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry, I didn't look at the clock. This is what happens when you're gelatin print. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Enjoy. Have a wonderful Saturday. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Mariana. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.